Hi there, here's our first presentation from OCR Biology A 5.1.1 Communication and Homeostasis. We're going to start with section A, the need for communication systems in multicellular organisms. So let's begin with what a multicellular organism is. Multicellular means made of lots of cells and usually the our usual examples are going to be a human being made of lots of cells and a large plant like a tree which is made of lots of cells. Now we're going to think about how either the external or the internal environment might change and why that might therefore need some coordination. So here's a response that we might need to respond to, very hot conditions. Here's our change in the external environment. As you get hotter it would therefore increase the temperature inside the body and that changes the internal environment. If we're changing that temperature, then if it becomes too high, what problem have we got? Enzymes. Enzymes are required uh, to work at a particular temperature. That temperature is exceeded. There's a risk that they denature and therefore cause problems. So we need to prevent those problems from occurring by modifying our temperature. Now those temperature responses could be behavioural move into the shade, have a cold drink, fan yourself, open a window. What examiners are more interested in, however, is physiological responses. What body changes occur that you don't have conscious control over that then cool you down or help to reduce the heat. So we can think of several things. Sweating. Sweating transfers heat to the environment. As the sweat evaporates, the heat is transferred to the environment around you and therefore is no longer part of you. Remember, it's energy transfer, not energy loss. We're never saying the energy is lost if the energy is being transferred to the environment. Another change would be vasodilation. The blood vessels are dilating. So small blood vessels near the skin dilate. That means more blood flows nearer to the surface of the skin, so more heat can be transferred to the environment by radiation, and in effect cooling you down. Third response, much less effective in humans than some other organisms, is the hairs lying flat. Uh, if the hairs lie flatter, then they should be uh, less heat being retained by insulation. Uh, as we're not very hairy as an organism anyway, it's not particularly an effective response in humans, much more so in other hairier organisms or organisms with lots of feathers. Our second example we're going to think about is eating a sugary meal. This will be an internal environment change again. If you increase the blood glucose, then if you increase the concentration of glucose in the body, then you're going to be affecting osmosis. So in other words, we're affecting the water potential of cells. If concentration of glucose builds up outside a cell, then you might have water moving out of a cell uh, in towards where there is more glucose. So therefore that could be causing problems. So to prevent that, the glucose is usually stored as a large molecule, glycogen. Glycogen is insoluble, so therefore it doesn't have an osmotic effect and doesn't affect the water potential. How might we regulate the glucose levels? This is hormonally controlled. So we produce insulin. Insulin from the pancreas causes glucose to be stored as glycogen in the liver and therefore removing some of that glucose out of the way. We'll think about all of these things in more detail throughout this unit. Now I want you to pause the video now and think about one of these three different things. So you can choose to think about what the body responses might be to very cold conditions or to very bright sunlight or for being chased by a tiger. Think about some of the things I've just been saying, choose one of them and write a short paragraph to describe what the body's responses might be and why they might need those responses. So pause now, choose C or D or E and write yourself a paragraph. Go on, pause. Okay, let's move on to plants. So how and why does a plant need to respond to very hot conditions? Not a surprise. Uh, again, if we've got exactly the same reasons why, if it's too hot, then it's going to affect the enzymes and therefore the uh, enzymes will denature. So no difference that plants contain enzymes in just the same way that humans do. Uh, how do they respond? Well, there's several responses. Um, we get, again, normally in plants, they're undergoing transpiration 
water is being transferred to the environment as water evaporates out of the stomata on the undersurfaces of leaves. So if it's a very hot day and that transpiration is occurring rapidly, then they might end up with loss of turga pressure. Normally plants, remember, don't have an exoskeleton, so they need to be held rigid by lots of water inside the cells being turgid. If that water uh, level is reduced, then the cells are not turgid anymore and therefore the leaves aren't held out and aren't as rigid. So overall, as an organism, you get wilting. The plant flops and becomes droopy. Um, it reduces the surface area exposed to light and therefore to heat, and therefore less transpiration is occurring. Another physiological response is that the stomata close. So in very hot conditions, because it's got to maintain as much water inside the cells as possible. So for a period of time, the stomata close to prevent the water from evaporating. Remember, the stomata are usually open so that the cells can be taking in gases and taking releasing gases, carbon dioxide in, oxygen out, but it forgoes that in preference of losing too much water otherwise. Okay, our second and final uh, plant response we're going to think about is sunlight from a particular direction. Now, remember, plants can't get up and walk around, so they can't move into more light if they're not getting enough light. So they need to be able to grow towards light so that they can ma maximise the amount of sunlight for photosynthesis. Remember, they need a light for photosynthesis and they need the water for photosynthesis, so therefore they've got to be able to maximise that sunlight. So what do they do? They grow towards it. Now again, you may or may not have covered this, but most of you should have covered this at GCSE. This is plant hormones, in particular a plant hormone called auxin. Auxin builds up on the shady side of a plant. And when it builds up on the shady side of a plant, it makes the cells elongate, grow longer on that side, the shady side. So if they're growing longer on one side, shorter on the other it curves and bends towards the light so the whole plant is growing towards the light okay just like before we're going to now think of a brief pause choose again one of these three increase in sunlight daily in spring so more and more sunlight across the day as the days get longer and longer water in a particular area of the soil or being damaged by a herbivore a plant eating organism again Choose one of these three and think about how and why a plant needs to respond to one of those three. Okay, pause again. And then once you've uh, paused, you need to be writing a paragraph. So why need to, why this need for communication? Again, we've just talked about the fact that enzymes need to be working at their optimum the internal conditions uh, can only cope with a very limited range. So very, very optimum te optimal temperature, optimal pH, optimal concentrations of different uh, substances like sodium ions and potassium ions and carbon dioxide. All of those need to be kept at their optimum or uh, the low level so that they're not toxic. For example, if in the substances might build up like carbon dioxide. In multicellular organisms that we have specialization, not all our cells are the same. Organisms have different cells for different purposes. So if you've got external cells and internal cells, cells need to be able to communicate and coordinate and do different things. And that communication is really important because the changes could be need to be quite rapid. If you've got a quick change in your external environment, for example, a predator, you need to be able to get away from that predator quickly. So the stimulus, seeing something occurring, the response that, that occurs from it needs to be super rapid so that you can escape from the predator. Uh, other changes in the external environment might be slow, slow and gradual. Uh, seasons change, so you get seasonal changes like foxes changing uh, colour. These are both the same uh, species of fox just winter and summer coat and you can see that one is much fluffier and obviously the right color to be camouflaged one much darker and less fluffy for the warmer times and again better camouflage so we have an external sort of layer uh, either skin or bark which is thick to protect us and internally a layer of tissue fluid 
uh, if you've got to keep those concentrations of substances at the right concentration to ensure that they don't build up. This is what homeostasis is principally about, regulating our internal environment. And we'll be thinking about that in our second presentation a little bit more. What we need to mention is the idea of receptors and effectors because we have cells that sense things and then cells that produce a response. So the sensory receptors, you think about the different senses that you have, you know what the five senses are, they detect changes, the effectors then produce our responses. And these are usually muscles or glands. Let's think about those in turn, receptors, they detect information from the external environment, but sometimes from the internal environment too, uh, and send information to the CNS your central nervous system, your brain and your spinal cord to coordinate the response. Um, you might not think about sweating being coordinated, but it is. There's a heat control center in your body that says send more sweat to the skin in response to a nervous signal. Again, we'll come back to that as we think about ectothermy and endothermy. Effectors produce an effect. So muscles move you from somewhere, glands produce a secretion. These are both effects that might be being produced. Okay, we're gonna uh, just think about the second bit of this because this is a tick, does exactly what it says on the, the, tin, the tin, cell signaling. Cells need to signal to each other. Uh, these can be a chemical response or an electrical response. So chemicals uh, go from one cell to another, hormones of what we're thinking about here. So they move across a cell and uh, go from one cell to another or with somewhere within the same cell. Um, there can be electrical buildup, but that's still in effect going to be producing a change in a chemical. So a change in sodium ions and potassium ions is what is occurring as to produce that electrical signal. Uh, and these, it can be short distances from one cell to another, but for hormones often it's large distances. Hormone made in the brain can be producing responses elsewhere in the body. So uh, the pituitary gland can produce responses in your kidneys, for example. So uh, plants also need to respond to changes in their environment using hormones. They do that in a similar way. Remember, they don't have a uh, nervous system, they don't have neuronal control. Okay, uh, that's the end of our first presentation. So we've covered A and B. The next presentation will cover learning aim C.